um, which was a form of remote learning. And I think later on you heard about distant learning. And now we hear so much about this online, online uh, or remote learning or online learning. But the, the difference, the big difference here was, is that in that, the previous iterations, uh, people made that choice. They choose to do correspondence courses or online uh, learning or distant learning so that they could have fit into their regular schedules or the status of life, whatever they want, status of life. But here we come, this form of um, online remote learning was forced on us by the pandemic. So nobody was quite prepared for it. So I know for in our case, we went for spring break and while we were in spring break, we were told now the spring break has been extended for another week while we try to sort things out. And the next thing is say, hey, nobody's coming back to campus. And then everybody now had to go lock down, stay at home orders, and then to be forced to learn as we go along. So this, this, this is somewhat different. This is different because it's not something that we had quite planned for. Even after the spring semester was over, the fall semester, we come back and then we are thrust into different modes of delivery. You know, they are telling us you can do online, you can do face-to-face, -face, you can do the branded or the hybrid or the high flex as they call it. And each one of them has its own challenges and people have been trying to negotiate through these challenges. And then they still talk of synchronous uh, learning where it's live, it's online, but it's live just like we're having it right now. Or there's the other one which is recorded where the students can at their own pleasure, they can go and sit and listen uh, to, the, to, to a recorded lecture. Uh, there's the, the second one, Synchronous learning, it's, it, to many students, it has brought a lot of challenges because in some cases, it's the student, the material, and the text, and not much support, right? The online, the full online has also had its own challenges because, well, the students have been trying to figure out how to utilize the space at home. You know, in many cases, you're at home, you have uh, your parents who are using the computer, you have your siblings who are using the computer, probably the internet is not so strong. So there are also those these challenges that the students have had to, to face. And um, many of these cases, I'm, I'm bringing this to, um, and also the question of disparities, the technology disparities, the financial disparities, we see them also in college where you see students, some students have the capacity to be able to learn without any challenges. On the other hand, you find students who are having a lot of challenges. Well, they may not have a computer. Well, they, they may not have a strong internet. They may not be able to print. They may not be able to browse. Um, there are also issues of Zoom bombing when if you don't have very good security, sometimes there are those people who just hack into a Zoom and then they show, um, they do all kinds of crazy things. And also you might be in a presentation and the computer freezes or you are. So it, it brings a lot of challenge to the students. And I think this is the point I'm trying to make that uh, for us as parents, I think we need to be aware of some of these challenges. Uh, I know we have already known about them but I think it's actually much more difficult for the students considering that uh, when students face some of these challenges in a campus or college or high school environment, is a support system. They will be able to talk to their friends. Oh, what did you get in this quiz? Oh, I, oh, I failed, I didn't get good grade. But then they'll talk and then maybe things will be smoothened over. Or alternatively, it could be students are preparing for a quiz or an exam, then they can work together. And they also, there are also other forms of support. They have in the dorms, they have the, the, the residential assist advisors who are supporting them. You have the professors they can work to. 
But when they're at home, I think many of our students are not able to deal with this as well as they would be dealing with situations on campus. Some of them are even having to look after the young ones. I have a case in one of my classes. I know one student who is always has, a, she has her younger brother and the brother really, really wants to get engaged in class, right? And the students sometimes feel so stressed out, but you know, we have sometimes to make the accommodation, tell them, don't worry, just, just have your siblings working along. So as parents, I think we need to, to look at some of these things and some of the things that we can do to help alleviate the stress, because granted, actually there's a lot of stress. Students are undergoing a lot of stress and they talk about it. They believe that the workload has become even heavier. In fact, the universities, the, our special university is telling us to go slow, that this, we are giving too much work to the students and the students feel so much overwhelmed. Even some of the best students, some of our children who are good students who get the A's and you know, they, they, they perform very well. This environment might be too challenging for them that it's a new environment, it's very hard to negotiate it, to navigate through it. So I think the best thing, the experience that we can do is to recognize that this is a big challenge. The best we can do is probably give that positive reinforcement. Let's look for little opportunities to support them. Tell them that, you know, whatever they're doing, they're doing a good job, okay? Because if you don't tell them, there might not be somebody to tell them, especially some of us, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Ivo and Dr. Modoni know this for sure. It's, we get a lot of these students, sometimes they'll come to your office and they're crying, they have all these problems. And sometimes you, you, tend, you end up as the parent or the counselor and help. But when they're at home, probably that is missing, you know, from their friends, from the associations that, several, uh, from the uh, fellow members of associations, it could be the African Students Association, it could be a Christian Union Association, it could be some other association. So that support system might not be there as much as we want to provide it as parents. We also have our challenges. We have our jobs. We have our work to do. We have our own stresses from here and also from back home that um, that is pushing us. Um, I don't know how I'm doing on time. I don't want to... What was... Gladwell, man, am I doing well? How, how much more time do I have? Yes, you have about uh, eight more minutes left. Eight minutes, good, okay. So positive reinforcement, I think, is one good thing that we should, uh, uh, we should, we should, uh, we should bear in mind. And I've always said this, I think we are the best advocates. We are this, the best advocates for our children. And we, are the, we should be those genuine cheerleaders, you know, when it's... Um, something difficult that is happening to them, whether it's in class or with the teachers or in college, if the grade is not so good. You know, you know, I know they don't want us to intervene, but if they want us to intervene, especially in high school, we should be those, we should be the advocate. We should not always agree with the judgments or some of the, well, the judgments that some of the teachers made. I, I usually bring this example. When I first came to the US, my son was doing very well. We brought him from Nairobi. And uh, he was a, a, brilliant, a brilliant student. And he goes to this school and uh, uh, the teacher calls me, hey, your son has a problem. And I said, what's the problem? Well, I think he has something to hide. I can't understand him. I said, what was the problem? Because he can't look me straight in the eye. And I said, well, that's the African culture. He cannot. He's not supposed to do. Because in African culture, looking somebody in a position of authority is threatening. And the teacher had said, oh, I didn't know that. I said, no, 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 okay. You wanted to punish him for something that you did not understand. And I think I bring that, not to say that I was, a, but I had to be that advocate and to say, well, if I had just followed what the teacher was saying, maybe my son would have been put into various different programs that, and it's out of the ignorance of the teacher. So we should be our strong advocate for, uh, for, for our children without letting them off the hook when they are actually doing something bad and also cheering, cheering them up. When they do something, let's cheer them, let's be our cheerleaders and genuine cheerleaders, not like some other cheerleaders that we have seen of late and uh, advocates. 
also around this time, success might not might look a bit different. You know, those students who get A's might not get straight A's. Um, those who get B's might also may not be there at this point because there are a lot of stresses in life right now. If we parents can feel it, maybe they themselves are also in a much more difficult situation. So as parents, let's also not, I would say, um, let's look at the situation differently and say, well, this, this child is handling a lot in life. And if they come home with a B and they have been uh, getting an A, let's not be so hard on them, you know, because we all know our kids to do very well, but it's a challenge. It's a challenging time. And, and as they say, well, Success takes different directions. It's not a straight line, what we always think. And there are those people who can start late and still succeed. We have seen that, especially in this country. With our children, uh, when we are together, let's also, um, I'm a big advocate of languages, <laughs> African languages. So let's, let's try to teach them whenever they have time. Let's take opportunity of this staying at home to get them to learn. Uh, let's teach them something. It could be flags of Africa. It could be just talking about languages. How do you say hello um, about this? This also is, is a way of supporting them. And let's be open to learning. If you will listen carefully, this generation Z knows a lot and they can teach us a lot. I have learned a lot by just asking some questions and just being open about it. And they know a lot, a lot of stuff. It could be not beyond technology because they are much better than we are in technology. Granted, that's so true. So they help us very much in trying to, you can, you can engage them when you have a computer problem. But other things, just let them help you with other um, things that, um, uh, just ask questions and sometimes you'll be surprised at some of the questions. Sometimes I even engage, we see something on TV like all these issues of social justice, I've learned a lot. Um, the LGBTQ issues. They know this very much. I'm not so familiar, but I've, through talking to my son, I think he has helped to explain and help me understand a lot of things. Music and uh, a lot of things that, uh, even about America that I don't know very much. You know, let them do things together. You know, teach them cooking. The lockdown helped us in so many ways. Maybe most of us Never had time to cook, but I think we really learn new dishes. And I think learning new dishes, even cooking together, it helps. It could be knitting. I remember my mom when she was ill and elderly and uh, at home alone, I used to buy her material to knit and she would knit. And uh, I think they say it's, very, it's, very, it's like meditation. It's very comforting uh, for those who know about it. But also I think as parents to give them support we need to also think of wellness, our own well-being. Because uh, I know with, from my colleagues, they can tell you that when the students are not doing well in class, sometimes it's because a family member is not doing well. So if a family member is ill, it also affects everybody else, especially if it's a parent who is not feeling well. It affects the student's performance and maybe they'll not be able to complete or maybe do well in an exam. So as much as we support them, uh, let's also support ourselves and try to think of wellness. It could be exercising, it could be walking, it could be things that make us much better. And when all is said and done, um, it's not so bad. Let's give ourselves a pat on the back. We have done well. Um, we have brought this uh, in this America where we are also facing our own challenges from work to discrimination, uh, to all kinds of crazy things as immigrants and all that. We doing well, and therefore, let's not be so hard on ourselves. Let's not be hard on them. Let's not be hard on ourselves. Let's try on and try to see where at least we'll be able to survive. And we have come a long way. And this has been a year of so many terrible things, you know, a lot of loss, a lot of yelling and uh, campaigning and terrible things. Let's, um, let's, let's be there. And uh, I saw this quote, which is the solution to every parenting problem starts with nine words. I'm here, I hear you, how can I help? Although when I counted those are not nine, they are 10. So maybe it's just saying it's not that easy. You know? <laughs> but I think the thing is, I'm here to support you. I think that's the thing. 
Let's, let's let them hear that because sometimes the students tell me, oh, my parents don't listen to me, you know. And even when you're talking about, um, when you're talking about telling them about Africa and the family history, uh, let's sometimes avoid even t- telling them so much about ourselves. I think they have heard that story so much, they only roll their eyes. Let's tell them about other family members first. The grandfather, the grandmother, the uncle, uh, you know, and other people in the village. And then as they keep to learn about them, they might come to talk to learn to us about uh, more about us. So, uh, but the thing is, let them hear that we listen. That, um, and I think that's what my students always tell me that if I just want to hear somebody say, I hear you, you know, what you're saying is valid. That's what they did, what they are saying. We can also always change it and uh, probably, um, so, and as I think as we are teaching those languages, I'm also trying to have, have a number of things that I'm trying to work to help in the diaspora through the learning of language. I have my books and also there's a site that I'm coming up for publishing, so keep posted. But uh, I'll stop there because I, I want to hear from my other colleagues and uh, just say thank you for your attention and Asante Thank you very much, Dr. Motonya. Just a few housekeeping uh, items. I should have talked about this before the meeting uh, began. One, kindly, if you join in and you're not muted, please mute yourself so that we do not interrupt the speakers as they go. Also, this is a recorded event. Uh, it's only the speakers that are being recorded. So don't worry that uh, you're being recorded without uh, your consent. It's just the speakers. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to send the questions on the chat or you can send them uh, to my WhatsApp, which my number is 314-546-7736. We will have a Q&A at the end of the meeting. If we can send the questions and compile them so that we don't have repeated questions at the end of the meeting, that will be fantastic. All right, you're going to move to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Modoni. Dr. Modoni is Chair and Associate Professor in the Department of Professional Counseling at Webster University. She was previously on the faculty of Southern Illinois University, Carbondale, and she has also taught at the University of Central Florida. She earned her PhD as a counselor, education and supervision from the University of Central Florida. She also holds a master's in counseling from Hindelberg University, Ohio, and a bachelor's degree in business education from University of Kenyatta, from Kenyatta University. She is a member of the American Association, American Counseling Association the Association of Counseling Education and Supervisors, and the Association for Multicultural Counseling and Development, among others. She is also a mentor in our mentorship program and a parent. Dr. Modoni today will be talking about mental health in youth and in adults. Dr. Modoni, welcome. Good evening. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, uh, Glad- Gladwell, for that introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. I really enjoyed listening to Dr. Mutonya as well. And one of the things that I'm so glad you mentioned, because I, I really want to sort of I, I plagiarize and take f- from you, uh, is that when we speak about these things, when I talk about our challenges that our youth are facing, I speak... Um, not from a point of having more knowledge than anybody else. Um, it's, it's really, um, there are many things I don't know. And uh, there are some things I know, but there's also a lot that I don't know. So I offer what I offer, uh, but I am always open to learning more and hearing, uh, learning more from your own experiences. Uh, my kids are young. I have uh, three kids that are 14. God, she's 15. She would kill me. Uh, she knew I'd got her age wrong. Uh, she's 15, uh, 12, and 8. And so I recognize that there are things about raising young adults that I don't know because you have, some of you have had those experiences. Um, 
but hopefully I would be able to share something of value and some, some things are applicable across, you know, uh, different generations, uh, different age groups. Um, and so take what you can and, um, and, and, and feel free to challenge what you don't necessarily think applies to you. So I was asked to talk about common stressors for the youth um, and our young adults. I, I would want to um, just trying to think of how to organize my thoughts. One of the things that I considered is, you know, there are many, many stresses in general, uh, but there are also some that are exacerbated by, by COVID. So I'll speak about stresses overall uh, for people in that age group. Uh, many of us, I imagine here, are parents. Um, we're raising children in, in um, many of our children are first generation Americans. We are probably all immigrants. There might be people here who are not necessarily immigrants as well, but most people here, I, I was just looking at who's on, who's, who's, who's attending, but we are, at least for myself, many are like me, that we are immigrants that are raising children in the United States. And it's important that we know what their experience is like, what are the challenges that they face, and how can we be supportive as parents, uh, and not just as parents, but also as part of the community. Um, and, and like I said, so there are things that they experience generally, but some of those have been made worse uh, by, by COVID-19. There are just some particular things about COVID that go beyond uh, the disease itself, beyond the virus, uh, and that it's a virus that has come with so many other, uh, other factors that we have to really be, be aware of and mindful about how it's affecting our, our youth. Um, when we talk about mental health, the most common things that we find are depression and anxiety. Those are sort of the most prevalent issues. When you look at the data, when you uh, listen about our most experiences, the things that plague many people are depression and anxiety. I've talked about those in the past. In our own community, um, I think talking about mental health can be somewhat challenging because it's a thing that we don't feel very comfortable talking about. It's so much easier for someone to say, I have this condition, I, my head hurts. I have, sometimes it's even easier to talk about cancer uh, or conditions like those than to talk about a mental health issue. So talking about a person that's having depression we don't have the language for it. Uh, when you think about even our own languages, we don't have language to describe the experience of depression uh, and anxiety. And so uh, the, the lack of language reflects the lack perhaps of even the concept. And so we struggle with how to understand it and how to, to support people who are experiencing that. Our youth do have an issue. And I think actually one of the things I'm finding out is not just youth. And I'm not finding that out recently. It's something I've known for quite a while that even amongst parents, our own selves, we suffer from depression. We suffer from anxiety, but we have other ways to explain it. We describe it as something else. But if you look at the, uh, the, the diagnostic manual, we have satisfied all of the criteria for depression and for anxiety. But we're going about life thinking, oh, you know, I'm just struggling here and there. And these, uh, these, there's something powerful about naming things for what they are. It frees us to deal with the issue. We stop struggling to name it, to identify. You cannot attack a thing that you do not know. So naming is critical. And with naming, there has to be a level of acceptance. So a person that is suffering from depression, instead of saying, oh, it's this, it's that, call it what it is. I think that's one of the things that's really important. Let's call it what it is. A person that's experienced seeing symptoms of depression, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, it is most likely a duck, right? So let's not find other ways to describe these things because as long as we're doing that, then we can't really attack it. We cannot support that person with, in, in, the way, in a way that will really be helpful for them. Uh, and we're likely to be seeking help in avenues that are not going to be helpful. So very important as a community uh, that we are open and honest about these conversations. So I say this because, you know, when you talk about the challenges and the stressors, uh, this in itself, so people are suffering from depression, but in addition to suffering from depression, they are suffering from, that the depression is made worse by their inability to talk honestly about their experience because of fear of judgment fear of being deemed to be lesser than or not as strong, 
And so they suffer in silence. And ultimately you find people pushed to the edge um, and dealing with these things in isolation. So I think that that's a major challenge. I'll come back to talking about what we can do. Uh, what are some things that we ought to be thinking about, what we ought to, to do in order to support our youth. Uh, anxiety is another one. Anxiety has been exacerbated uh, so much by, by COVID. Uh, there's so much that's uncertain. Uh, anxiety, you know, it manifests itself in different ways. But the fears that people generally have are made worse by the uncertainties that surround the pandemic. Um, and then people are forced to be in spaces right now. You know, I've been quarantined. I'm not quarantined. I've been at home with my family. I've never, I've not set foot in my office since March. I went one time to pick up a laptop. I've not been to my office since March. I've been working in this space right here in my basement with my family, who sometimes, depending on what the government decides, they're in school, sometimes they're at home, learning from home, um, but we are all in this space. I have very little of an outlet. So I see my family all the time. I love them, but my goodness, <laughs> uh, I could use some company, right? Uh, and I'm sure they too could use a different company. So one of the things that we struggled, for example, as a family, when our children were given the option of going into school uh, a few days a week, the question of do we let them go or do we opt for the virtual learning? And, you know, there's been so much back and forth about what's the right thing to do. But for our kids, we, we knew, especially for our girls who are uh, young teenagers, that that connection at that particular age is so critical. And we weighed our options and we decided that it was better to let them go to school on the days that they could, um, just so that they have that bit of an outlet. So understanding your kids, it's important. So for us, that was a challenge. And I knew if we didn't let them go, we we're going to be dealing with other things here. Um, and that's not to say that we haven't struggled. We still struggle in many ways uh, because girls really are much more social than boys are. And so they, their struggles are different than those of a boy. Boys express their, their anxiety in different ways. And I'll come to talking about that in a, in, in a little bit. So, um, so anxiety has been a major thing and, um, and, and something that we have grappled with. And I know that that's something that the youth uh, and young adults are grappling with. Um, and those things are made worse, like I said, by, um, by isolation, the social isolation that has come up as a result of, of, uh, of the, um, the pandemic. But even outside of, of COVID, because I don't want us to think that, you know, once everybody gets back to, and we have a vaccine and we go back to life as normal, that we no longer have to pay attention to these issues. This is a pervasive issue in our community. Um, and so here's the, 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 the thing about it that is so ironic, that anxiety builds on itself. It perpetuates itself. The thing that you, you feel most anxious about when you don't have a way to seek help it gets, it builds on itself and it self perpetuates so that people can sink and just spiral sometimes out of control. So um, again, just we have to really be mindful um, of, of what's going on with our young people. Um, they struggle with a sense of identity. Who am I? Um, what's my place here? Uh, you know, I go back and forth with my children um, and I think we've come to a place where I, I know, I like to think that they're Kenyans, but they are really Americans with Kenyan heritage. Uh, that's been a journey for me as, an, uh, as a Kenyan parent, because I really want to push that part of their heritage. Um, but I also recognize that it's my journey and not theirs. That's the part that I think of as Kenyan parents and as immigrant parents generally, I think we, we, I don't want to say wrong, go wrong, but we miss the boat sometimes in really pushing our agenda. Um, and I have heard this in countless conversations because I've spent a lot of time talking with, uh, with our youth where we want uh, their experience to be somehow like our own experience. We want their, them to grow up like we did uh, and want to put the same parameters around their experience that were 
in our own growing up experience. Um, I know we've talked here, even in some previous forums, about how, you know, we talk about the walk to school. If a child is experiencing an issue, we tend to minimize their concern and say, oh, you have it so good. What are you complaining about, right? When I was your age, can you hear me? Yes. I saw someone, uh, John Kill, um, you may have to admit me. Anyhow, um, but so we minimize their experience. We minimize their depression. We minimize their anxiety. We minimize their sense of isolation and the things they're complaining about. Uh, because when we were their age, we didn't have these things that you have. I didn't have a phone. I didn't have this. I didn't have this. Um, and so I expect that you should be fine and happy and stop complaining. Your life is really good uh, compared to mine. Um, but that's my comparison. It's not theirs. They have nothing to compare it to. So as long as we're using our own experience as a yardstick to measure that experience, what our children are experiencing, uh, or young adults, or we will always miss the boat. We will always miss the boat. The reason this is difficult to conceptualize is that we do this with good intentions. We think we're strengthening them, and so we think it's a really good thing. But there are other ways to build resilience and strength in a child without minimizing or dismissing their experience. So let's recognize that this is a different place um, with different expectations, with different experiences, and that they don't have to match ours. And the fact that they don't match my experience doesn't make that any less important. Right. So the fact that my child doesn't have to worry about the light bill, doesn't have to worry about food, doesn't have to uh, to travel several miles to school in the morning, does not mean that the sense of isolation and the fears that they have are not real and significant for them. Um, so a sense of identity going back and forth. I also have spoken with kids. Um, we tend to live in areas that are you know, we, we, we have a mix of people, right? So we have African-American kids, we have our own children and we're sending them and we're saying, oh, don't mix with those people because they are bad, right? I'm just speaking candidly people because, you know, you can look at me like you don't say these things, but I know you do because I have heard them from the kids when I talk with them, right? Uh, so there's this sense of, oh, these people, they're going to lead you astray. Don't do this. But what we do by, 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 by creating that sort of an environment is that they will not talk openly to us about their encounters at school. So it's almost like they live a separate life with their friends at school. And when they come here, they're living a different life. So navigating two lives, uh, one, this is who I am with my pa parents and my family. This is who I am outside of here. That can get very exhausting. It's tiring and it's exhausting mentally. And at some point, something's got to give. So it's, an, it's important that we are not putting that burden on our children to balance two different kinds of existence. And I'll come to talk about how we do that because it's, uh, I don't want, want to just say what we should, uh, how it should be, but I'll, I have a few ideas about how we can do that. Um, and one last thing I had was um, just sort of two things. I'm thinking about, this is really truly about this, the situation that we have had with COVID. Uh, there are financial stresses in our, in our own homes. Um, our children carry our own burdens. They are, and that's a mental health stressor. Uh, it adds to their worries. It adds to their concerns. They don't know how to support us. Uh, in some instances, we have seen a lot of relational strife uh, made worse by the lack of outlets and sense of isolation that people have. Uh, we have uh, families um, at war with one another. Uh, one of the things that is on the rise is domestic violence. We have seen an increase, a marked increase in domestic violence um, and suicide as well. In the past, we used to worry about isolation. There was the idea of isolation and loneliness as an epidemic among senior citizens. But now that data is shifting, where we're seeing that come to the younger and younger generations. Uh, so it's a real thing. So I'm looking at my time and I wanna stay within the time that's allotted to me. Um, fear of failure, um, 
some things that I was thinking about, fear of failure, fear of judgment, fear of not being good enough, uh, fear of letting down their parents and letting down the community. These are things that make, uh, that make um, for a much more difficult experience for our young people growing up. So what do we do? First thing, um, recognize what's going on. In order for me to recognize that my child has symptoms of depression, I have to know my child. This is so basic. I know you might think it's really basic. I have to know my child. When someone is experiencing depression or anxiety, there is a marked change in behavior. You will not see the change in behavior if you don't know that person. So the first thing you have to know is to do is know them. Be familiar with your child. Don't be strangers living in the same household. Talk with them. Ask questions, be attentive, ask questions even when you feel like you're being intrusive. Even when you're afraid to ask the questions, be brave, be bold, let them know I'm asking this because I care about you, but also make an effort to build a relationship with your kids, right? I'm, I'm saying this, but uh, please don't say, don't, don't think that I'm assuming that people don't do this, but I, I just want to encourage um, and this is a, a, a good thing to do. Um, choose your battles. What are the things that you really want to be fighting with your kid about? Do you want to fight about everything? There are some things that are greater in, that have greater consequence than others. In my head, I have to think, okay, if today you decide you're sleeping till 10 or 11, that's okay. Nothing's gonna, you know, it won't kill anybody, right? So if that's what you have to do today or tomorrow, I'm fine with it. Uh, but then there are other things. I won't let you all go, go off with a friend because that then I would have concerns about it. But I think sometimes we approach the idea, we, we feel a need for control and we make every issue a control issue um, because we want to assert that we are the parent. And so we're fighting about really small things. Sometimes and uh, it even can be as, um, I don't wanna really give examples because everybody, every family is different and the things that you, that your values are different, but take a look at your values. Take a look at the things that you talk about as a family. See what are really critical, uh, the kinds of things that are critical to keep your family values, but look at some of the things that you fight about with your kids that don't really make that much of a difference and that you can go a little easy on. That way, when you have conversations about the things that matter, they are more likely to listen to you and take you seriously. But if you're fighting about everything, then there's, there's really, you know, nothing can be taken seriously. You cease to be taken seriously anymore. Ask questions, be attentive, educate yourself. Ignorance is not place. Don't say you don't know about America. I have heard that so many times. We always say, oh, I don't know how things work here. How long have you been in this country? How much longer can you not know how things work in America? Don't keep saying that. At some point, you're just a broken record. Um, it's not a good thing to keep saying, I don't know how this works. Ask, right? People have phones, you have the internet, even if you're an older, I've seen many, many older individuals really truly take time to educate themselves. Immerse yourself in the kinds of things that your children are engaged in so you can learn. I didn't know, I think I've given this example before. My daughter wanted to be a cheerleader and I'm thinking, why are you going to be a cheerleader? Why can't you do a real sport so I can come and cheer for you? And you're not going to cheer for other people, right? I was really annoyed about it. And she kept asking to be a cheerleader and I was saying no, but she was really adamant about it. And eventually she... She went around it, she talked to her friends, she went for practice, she tried out and she got accepted. I have become, I've been really humbled by that experience. I have learned so much about what cheerleading is and is not. It's really helped with her discipline, with her persistence, perseverance, team, you know, working as a team, discipline, work ethics. She wakes up at six to be at practice in the morning. Um, there's so many things about it that I didn't know because I was coming from a Kenyan perspective where we thought cheer is bad. You're going to be wearing this little skirt and you'll stand there and cheer people who are doing real sports. Cheer is a real sport. It's a real, it, it, it is real. I know that from experience, but I could have taken this attitude like, oh, I'm Kenyan, we don't do that. So 
be flexible, be open to experience. I've learned a lot about cheer now. I've learned a lot about things that I didn't know about before. Today, I sent my children TikToks this morning and they were laughing. They said, oh, mom is sending TikToks now because I want to know what are you seeing? I can either say you can't be on TikTok, I can get there and see what are they doing so that I can have those conversations with them, right? So it's again about choosing our battles and thinking, so am I going to fight about TikTok or am I going to talk with them so that when they engage in TikTok, they are responsible, right? They're doing so in a responsible manner that they're informed. Um, so learn about American culture. I talked with a kid the other day who was telling me, oh, my mom is always following BDI. She's always talking about, B is it called BDI? The thing with Rayla and somebody else. I don't even know who, they, who, who it is. Not that I don't care about Kenyan policies, but I really don't. Uh, but my mother is always watching Kenyan TV um, and she's talking about this. It's good to know about Kenya. I'm not saying don't know, <laughs> but if I asked you who is your senator, would you know? Can you tell me who's the mayor of your city, right? Can you tell me who's the principal of your kid's school? Can you tell me how, how your child is doing in school? Those kinds of things. Uh, we're living in the United States. You're raising your kids here, unless you plan to relocate. You're raising your kids for life in America. Behave as though you are. Learn that, recognize it. Learn about this place so that you're informed about your environment. Um, and then the last thing I will say is about being willing to be vulnerable. As a parent, there's the idea that I need to know everything, but there are many things I don't know. But I also have personal struggles. I might be struggling with finances. I might be struggling with uh, illness. I might be feeling this, maybe I'm just, you know, I'm struggling with weight uh, or something or other. Sometimes I may not be feeling motivated, right? I'm really tired of my work. I want to change careers. Um, you don't have to be perfect in the eyes of your kids. Being imperfect and honest about your failings, about your struggles, opens the door to them to know that you're real. They can talk to you about their own struggles and experiences, about their fears, about their failures. But we have to do this in a way that you're sensitive about the age of the child. You know, it's age appropriate. I don't want to talk to my eight-year-old about uh, finances. He doesn't need to know that, right? But my 15-year-old, I will talk with her because she needs to know so that she can understand what are some of the things that we're struggling with. So talking to our children and being open in a way that is age appropriate, um, will go a long way in, a, in building relationships and giving them a sense of support, but also helps to address the mental health issues that, that might arise. I'm gonna leave it there because I've talked way too long and turn it over to uh, Gladwell, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mothoni. Um, we are going to move to our last speaker who is Dr. Waigua. Dr. Waigua is um, a senior pastor at Rehema Gospel Church in Loving Texter, Texas and Department Chair of Religion and Philosophy at Wally College. He is married, he's married to his honey, Okemoveri, Tabitha Waigua, and together they have three children. Solomon and Tabitha believe that families are institutions where each member individually is welcomed and allowed to have their own goal, aspirations, and pursue their dreams. Dr. Waigua will be talking to us today regarding balancing between two cultures. Dr. Waigua, welcome. I thank you so very much, uh, my brothers and sisters. Uh, I really benefited listening to Dr. Mungai and uh, uh, Dr. Mudoni. Uh, that was very insightful. And uh, first of all, thank you for organizing this. This is needed uh, in our time. And I pray that uh, we can be able to uh, invite uh, others to come and participate. I'm so sorry that uh, nobody in my church is here today. Uh, what I have heard ought to have been heard even from the pulpit. Uh, and uh, we need to publicize this uh, when it is happening. Uh, so I need to be given the calendar so that I can uh, uh, share this. Uh, with people. Uh, now, having said that, uh, let me uh, appreciate uh, uh, you all for inviting me here. Um, 
uh, it's been a very busy weekend. Uh, well, approaching the weekend. I, I'm thinking like it's weekend or, or already. It's Friday though, but um, yesterday was uh, our anniversary. We clocked 37 years, uh, my Thank wife you. and I, and uh, 37 years together uh, looking at the same face. Isn't that beautiful? Um, and so uh, today I took my wife to work rather than how to drive. And uh, so I took her uh, she is a nurse manager, and so she has to see uh, people. So I took her there and uh, <laughs> realized that I can't go pick her because of this. So I asked her to take Uber, and we were to come to my daughter for, for dinner. Uh, and I do not know whether she's made it, but, but I will have to know uh, later. Uh, but uh, so, so here we are, and I really appreciate being here. And the topic is very dear to me. That uh, and I thank the the, the speakers who have come before me because uh, the topics were pertinent to to the family and, and and raising children. Let me say something that is not in my notes. The Bible says for us to train up children. The the task of raising children, you know, the whole thing about pedagogy. Uh, it's it's the, 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 the children's stuff, pedagogy. It's the, it's the doing the kids stuff, raising them, okay? You know, paideia and logos, that's all it means, you know? It's, it's about children. And how do you raise them? Uh, uh, the, the technical term there, as you are aware, is um, uh, training and up. So we're training them upwards. And, and I want to... Uh, Talk about the challenges that we encounter uh, here doing this in the United States because the question I was asked to address is balancing between two cultures uh, and parenting in the United States. Uh, the inference here must be uh, for an African like me and yourself who are raising uh, children in the United States, we are in the Western world, and we come, our essence is from the non-Western world. So we have the two cultures, the Western culture, uh, this may apply to people in Europe, uh, Australia, and, and all the uh, uh, Western culture, nation, Western nations, uh, versus African uh, ourselves. And even to be more specific, you could zero into to Kenya and, and to even farther go to uh, our specific ethnic communities. I don't like the word tribe very much. Uh, ethnic communities like the Tulkana, uh, the Luo, uh, or whatever it is that uh, somebody is injured from, uh, they have come from the Akoya people. So what we hear when we come to uh, the West, uh, is that especially in America, you have heard of the popular phrase, the melting pot. And the idea is that all of us, uh, the people we find here in ourselves, are supposed to be put in a, in a melting pot and, and the temperatures are raised and we, we melt and mix and we're supposed to be branded into whatever it is that we are going to become once we have melted and blended together. And, and I think I, I, I'm not a fan of the melting pot idea philosophically. Uh, and this is because it, it does a lot of violence to, to who the person is. Uh, that's one. The second one, and I don't want to dwell with that because I'm, I'm, I have to move the balancing part and the two cultures, uh, but the melting part. Secondly, I, I don't like it because when I look at the reality, I find that it's only me who is melting. The Western person does not melt, you know, and, and so I'm being lied to, you know. I, it's, not, it's not true because uh, to really melt means we are all put together and we are going to begin to have aspects that are similar. Uh, and, but uh, there's no way I can make my uh, American friends love Ugali. Uh, and, and therefore I have developed a distaste 
of hamburgers as well uh, as a response. So, so I don't like the melting pot. I suggest rather uh, the salad bowl, if you will. Uh, I like to think of us as a salad bowl, uh, this culture that we have come into, so that uh, uh, the tomatoes stay as tomatoes and, and, and the, 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 the good taste brought by the zucchinis and, 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 and all, all, all those other things put together, the carrots, you don't want to pulp them into, into one thing. You just want to take them as they are so when you chew them, you can feel the potato, you can feel the tomato, you can, you can it, it becomes more wholesome. So, so the salad bowl uh, instead where, uh, and, and what I'm saying here is everyone maintains their heritage is doable uh, and, and uh, uh, shared uh, values, especially uh, cross-cultural, that we can share those if we maintain them. Uh, I have seen uh, here in the U.S., you, you will go to certain communities and you will find if you want to buy Czech bread from the cultures of Czechoslovakia, here in Texas, you want to drive south on I-35 and go to a city called West. It's famous for Czech bread and cakes and, and all that confectionery. And, and the city prides itself uh, for that. You go farther south uh, of Austin, you're going to find a city that is that prides itself at being Germanic, you know. Uh, they don't speak German, all of them are speaking English, but they, they have these German festivals. So what, what's wrong with that? That's very, very good because it's happening within this large salad bowl called the United States. So, so I want to say I, I emphasize that everyone maintained their heritage but be able to share them, uh, especially the values thereof, cross-culturally. This is possible. Uh, uh, you may be familiar with Professor Ali Mazrui. Uh, Professor Mazrui uh, tells us, or he advocated what's called tripartite heritage, speaking about us Africans. He says we have a tripartite heritage because we have... Uh, inherited uh, values from three different directions. We, he's, he's thinking of the, the African direction uh, and perspective. He's thinking of the Western perspective. And he's also thinking of the Asian perspective. So when you go to uh, Kenya, for instance, or you go to a Kenyan home here in the U.S., you are definitely going to find something like Ugali, which is essentially African, but uh, you may also find chapati, which is uh, Indian. Uh, but uh, you may also find something that comes from uh, uh, Middle East, like Kiswahili, which is uh, a mixture of African languages and uh, Arabic. And, and so you have that fine mix of cultures coming together and, and, and they don't fight. They, they are blended very well, even back home. And I do believe that we can uh, do the same, uh, the same here. So what I want to talk to you uh, very briefly here is culture, diversity, and integration. Uh, and I want to emphasize that there is a place of shared values. I like that uh, Modoni uh, Varnard talked about you know, family values, and, and that's where I am. Uh, many of you uh, may be aware, those of you that know me, that uh, my family uh, came here in 1996. My kids were just very, very young. I've raised all my three children here. My baby came at the age of four, and all of them, and I say all of them, look like me in terms of culture. They speak three languages like me, uh, because that's what I wanted to replicate. I wanted to raise a Kenyan, somebody who can decide to go back home and run for MP or for president and not having to do so through an interpreter. I am big, uh, like you, my brother, I am big in languages. But here we are in the US and we are caught to balance between those, these two cultures. And I want to say that when we develop family values, that will help us to balance between these two cultures. You see, I like to see family 
as social institutions. I like to think of a family as a corporation. All right? Uh, you think of Walmart. Now, if you are, you are blindfolded and you are taken to Kmart, for instance, or you are taken to Kroger, for instance, and they have removed the names, uh, Kroger uh, or whatever it is that they take you there, and then you are unfolded and, and you look at the mondas operandi, if you will, if you look at the way of doing things, the way they organize themselves there, you are going to see a culture and you're going to, when you, I, when you look at that culture, you're going to say, oh, I'm right in Walmart. The way they arrange things, the way they do things, the way they function here. Oh, I'm in Kruger. I'm not in the other grocery. Why? It's because they have corporational values that they have engendered over the years. And I am an advocate of every family doing shared values. You know why I'm saying this? It is because... Tabitha and I have been able to raise three children who came here as toddlers, but they are a corino of a corinos. They have been educated to the highest level of learning in these United States, yet they still speak their language to where when their grandmother, when she was alive, could speak with them for hours. I could hear them laughing. In, the, in their bedroom, they're calling grandma, and they're doing that because they still have that connection, linguistically speaking, and culturally speaking. They have not lost that. That's why I wanted to raise. And, and, and so, uh, 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 just bless them with that. So families become corporations. And, and so when you have a value, family value, which mine was, we are Kenyan, we are Akurino, and we speak a language called Kikuyu, and then we speak a language called Swahili, and we speak a language called English, and we want to speak those languages well. And so you raise that human being, that individual, and you are raising them for, the, for these United States to be able to function in the highest office in these United States, speaking Kikuyu, speaking Kiswahili, speaking English. It is possible. And if they choose to go to Kenya, they will still be able to go to the rural area and they can still serve there. <laughs> Interestingly, uh, my son works for the World Bank. He's a, he is a um, public uh, uh, finance specialist with the World Bank. And uh, now, because of COVID, he can work from anywhere. He just got married in June. And uh, uh, so he comes and says, Dad, we're going to Kenya for three months. We'll be working from Nairobi. They've already bought a place and they want to, they want to live there for, for, for three months before they learned it out. Isn't that amazing? That, that's what we thought when we were raising uh, 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 these babies. It is that they can be able to, they are citizens of the world. Now, the Bible asks whether two can walk together if they do not agree. That is in Amos 3 and verse 3. Uh, the text, the, the translation I like to use says, can two walk together except they be agreed? Uh, I like what it says in other Bibles, uh, do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? So in a family, you may have more than two if you have children. And you may have three if you have one child, four if you have two. And those people cannot succeed walking together in these two cultures unless they be agreed. So I want to put it to you that what we need is shared values. Values that are, and that is what I think is lacking with many of our families, that kids grow here without values that call at them to the attention of the family. And that's why you will find that they will insist on doing what the Joneses do down the street. And when that question arises in my own home, I say, well, this is not the Joneses. This is the Waiguas. 
and uh, we don't do that. The, 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 the Germans, is, that's their culture, that's their way of doing things, you know. Um, you are 13 and, and, and uh, you're telling me that uh, the Joneses, the, uh, Mr. Jones allows his son, who is 12, to bring his uh, girlfriend. Uh, I am telling you, you are 12 like him, but that's not going to happen because you are not there yet. I don't think that's where you are right now. And so, and then we talk about that and we share that value and they begin to see why there are some things that are better. You're not going to isolate one girl and, and, and bring her closer to you. And then you're talking of exes, uh, so many exes before you are even 19. You know, I want to say this, shared values are so important and I'm not ashamed of them because they are associated with worth they are associated with meaning, and they are associated with, uh, 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 you know, uh, with a desire to become successful. Shared values are primary source of motivation uh, in people's lives. They are considered to be the foundational ethics in any community and in a, in a culture. When people's values are met or matched, they feel a sense of satisfaction, a, sen a sense of harmony, a sense of rapport. When their values are not met, when their values are not matched, they feel dissatisfied. They feel incongruent. In fact, they even feel violated because their values have not been met or even matched. So in any organization, including the family, that values and gender trust and they link member to member. The dysfunctionality we find in many families, including American families, is coming because of that lack of something that they have in common. Shared values, they form a type of non-physical framework that binds people together and surrounds all their interactions within that system called the family. This is important because values are related with belief. Uh, one of our values in this, my family, is we are Christians. And we are confessing Christians. We are that, not just Christian. We are confessing Christians. Born again, spirit, feel, tongue, talking, all those things. And above all that, we put on a turban because we are a Corino and we want to maintain that value. See? So when you do that, whatever value that you pick, for us, we pick Kiremba, Mukurino, uh, education, church, school. Those, those are values that are very, very important. For instance, my kids uh, uh, make fun of me when they say that, that um, uh, you know, in our family, when, when you get up in bed, you don't, you, on, on a Sunday morning, you don't uh, ask, oh, will I go to church this morning? No. Uh, Daddy says, you, you, you don't. That question does not even begin to be formed in your brain because you are our ego. Our value here is on Sunday morning, we go to church. That's what we've done. That's what we will do. We go to church. It's either the church or the ER. Take your pick. And, 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 and so they will laugh about that. And even when they go out and they are professors and they get married and they are this and that, they have never missed church because that is a value that was inculcated in them. And they're proud of it. They owned it. It's shared. Sharing means they possess it. It's not just given by the parent. No, the parent directs them towards it and they took it. So it becomes a motivation. And I'll give an example uh, 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 that I like to give before I close here. But let me say this. So shared values and beliefs become the group which holds the organization together. And when organization think of the family. So conflict, conflicts of values become a source of disharmony and dissension. Sometimes you'll have conflicts. Uh, I remember one time my daughter having uh, graduated with her RN years ago, and uh, she went to buy um, nursing uh, slacks. I think that's what they call them, slacks. 
It's not. Whatever, you know, the, 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 nothing uniform. Uh, so they go, she goes and uh, she can't find uh, dresses. But she says, well, I am not going to wear pants because I happen to be a Mokorino. And one of my values as a Mokorino is I, I don't wear a Corinos. A Corino women have not started wearing, you know, uh, uh, jeans and, 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 and trousers. And I'm not going to do that. So, so you know what she did? She just called me one day and said, Dad, let's meet at Walmart. And we go to Walmart, and she asked me to pick this box, take it to the car. And it was a single sewing machine. The girl had decided if they do not wear, make dresses for nurses, she's going to learn to make them because she's not going to quit being a nurse, but she's not going to throw away her value. I'm just lifting that example. Now she has a PhD. She still goes to, to she's, just, she's a professor. She's a chair of the department, but she is a Mokorino woman and that's how she identifies herself. Now she came to this country nine years old, but I'm not talking about that girl. I'm talking about the values. Now, whatever value you lift, I was, was a Kolino. What's yours gonna be? Whatever value you choose, to identify your family, that becomes values become identity, which a family is known in its social environment. The values must be status, stated as, as both you know, corporate objectives and individual goals. It's us and myself, us and myself, because we, we have shared this. So my friends, I've talked about values and, and I've talked about how important it is for each family to engender cultural values, religious values, intellectual values, philosophical uh, values, emotional values even. There are some things we don't talk this house. There, 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 there are certain ways we do not speak this house. I remember uh, just uh, two days ago, I was watching a movie with my daughters. And uh, this movie had too many curse words. And my wife says, oh my God, this is, this is too much. And one of my daughters uh, uh, said this, and I, I was like, wow. She said, well, you know what? We have to learn to be able to watch such a movie because this is not different from being at Walmart because you hear the same language sometimes in Walmart. People will talk that this is the way Americans speak. Most, some of them, some of them, not all of them. So, so we are in this society. What we have to do is to be, to develop some skin and say, we don't talk like that in the Waigua family, but the environment speaks like that. And we live here. So what we have to do is to adapt, to adapt. How am I doing in terms of time? Oh my God, I need to quit. Uh, so so uh, let me conclude by saying three things. We got to, so we have developed these values that each family must develop. We don't talk like that in this house. You know, in this house, we do not go to bed before we finish our homework. Why? Because this is us. This family, we go to church. This family, we say please, we say thank you. Okay, so you have that. It will help you to adapt. You adapt to change. Number two, you act on opportunities that come for each member of the family. And number three, it will help you to overcome challenges. Overcoming challenges while holding on and changing shared core values. That is what I have seen happening in this little family uh, that I happen to be a parent, is we have weathered a lot of challenges by lifting the values that we have and using them. We, we, we cannot throw the towel because we don't do that. We have a God who helps us and so we take the opportunities and overcome the challenges, but we still maintain unchanging core values. Once we understand those core values, we are going to become whatever it is that we can become while maintaining us, maintaining who we are. 
Thank you for having me. God bless you. I'm sorry I went over with by almost five minutes. Back to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Dr. Waigua. For the information that you gave us, we are definitely not going to penalize you for the extra time. We appreciate you being here. Uh, special thanks to also Dr. Motonya, Dr. Motoni. You guys have really all been a blessing to us. And the information that you shared with us will definitely go a long way. We are now going to move to our Q&A questions. Uh, I have a few questions to start with. And after we run, uh, I have three questions to start with. And after that, I will open the floor for anyone who has a question. If you have a question, kindly unmute yourself. And also let us be uh, courteous to one another. We talk one person at a time. All right, the first question is uh, mainly directed to Dr. Motonya. Are there resources that, uh, are schools providing resources that parents can use to support their kids re remotely? If there are resources, where can the parents find them? Dr. Motonya. Thank you for that question. Um, I know schools do things differently, but um, I know across the board, many schools do provide accommodations of different kind. And some of the things that um, the schools are trying to work with, especially Washu that I know, is to encourage students and the parents to get in touch with the advisors, through the advisors, through their professors, to talk their issues out. I think one of the most important things that I always try to encourage our students, especially who come to Ashu or that I talk to, is approach your professors. The professors are human beings and they also have gone through a lot of the things that, that you've gone through, if not as students, but also as parents, so they understand. So if there are any issues on issues of catching up on online learning, if you have any difficulties, I think it's always the best thing is just to ask. Check with the school, check with the respective schools. Schools have the resources. And I think also with this, what they're they calling, I think the CARE Act or whatever it is, some of the schools have that, they have money for that. So if a student doesn't have the technology or the, 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 the broadband to be able to take classes, I think there's that kind of support. So talk, ask, knock the door. They say, when you, unless you knock the door, nobody's going to know that you're there and they will not open for you. But also accommodations. Sometimes I'm surprised. Every time I begin teaching a course, I get all these students with letters coming and saying, well, you have to provide this kind of accommodation. You know, I need extra time to finish exams. I need extra time to do my quizzes, right? And that is, that's a law. I think it's uh, the, the Congress passed that. And I think they have to get those kinds of accommodations. So if anybody is going through anything, my suggestion is there are resources in the universities. Ask, don't be afraid to ask. And the worst you can do is just somebody tell you, well, try somewhere else. Or maybe they'll guide you to the right person. But please ask. I think it's always important. The parent or the teacher, the students. Thank you, Dr. Mutonia. Our next question, it looks like it's geared mainly for Dr. Mutoni. Uh, the question is, how do I balance life for kids now that they have to be at home more and most of their distractions have been taken away? What can I do as a parent to fill the void? Dr. Mutoni? Dadwa, could you read that again? Yeah. How do I balance life for kids now that they have to be at home more and most of their distractions have been taken away. What can I do as a parent to fill the void? Hmm. Uh, I, I'll start by saying that this is challenging. I recognize we have become very dependent on devices and other things to fill time and to occupy uh, children. I know, especially people who are up north, like you know, in Missouri, it's getting cold now. So, you know, in the past, I could tell my kids go outside and play on the street while I work for a bit, but I can't do that now because it's getting colder. 
Um, it calls for creativity and conversations with your kids. Um, I don't know that there's an easy way to do that other than, again, like I said, learn what their interests are. I'm sure we already know many of those. There are things that we think are, are beneath us as parents um, that I can't be doing this with my kids because I have to maintain this kind of image as a parent. Uh, but letting go of some of those things and really truly uh, coming to meeting the kids at their level um, and, and doing things that we, we didn't do. I think that's one of the things that COVID has really taught us, that it has pushed us all out of our comfort zones. Uh, and that we're doing things in the past that we never imagined we could do. So whether it's sitting down and um, painting, one of the things I've, I've done lately with my kids now, I do a lot of... Um, Oh, I wish I had that. Uh, I've started to paint. I've started to crochet with my kids. I love that you talked about cooking. Uh, this is a great opportunity to pass on some of those skills uh, and, and hobbies uh, with to our children. So it may be something that I don't particularly enjoy, uh, but I don't like to play Monopoly. I think it takes way too long, for example, and I just don't really have much of an interest, but I've had to learn that because it's what my children like to do. So uh, the other thing too, even on TV, we have found some great shows that we watch as a family. So that, uh, you know, I'm not having everyone in their room doing whatever, but we have time as a family. So we have structured time. I recognize one of the things about teenagers, they want their own time. People want to feel a sense of independence. So I have time in my room, I'm doing what I'm doing, but that we, I recognize that and I honor that, but we also very careful to carve out time to spend together. Like I said, it's very easy to be families in the same space, especially when, you're feeling pressure and everyone's on top of each other to be in the same space, but not really to be together. So we have to be very intentional about combating that and intentional about being together, not just being in the same space. So finding activities that you can share. And like I said, it could be, here's the thing about, um, and I t tell this to my students, we always talk about self-care, for example, in my program, self-care, self-care. Uh, and when you think about self-care, people think about, oh, I have to start going to the gym. I have to meditate. I have to do this. If you didn't go to the gym before, you're not going to start now. If you didn't meditate before, you're most likely not going to start now. And if you do, it will not be sustainable because you'll get tired and you'll find you don't have time in your life for it. So the idea is about looking at the things that you already do and rethinking those things so that you're repurposing the things that you already do to give them a different meaning. I gave an example one time where cooking, I'm not particularly keen on, I don't enjoy cooking very much. Uh, it's just a mundane thing. You know, Kiku is how we are. You throw a rose, you throw these, you throw these and pour a lot of water, make sure you have a lot of soup. Uh, <laughs> And so for me, food is really like, let's get this done quickly and do, move on to the next thing. But I have come to appreciate my time in the kitchen and I usually will get one of my kids to come in and today we're gonna do this together. So I don't have to reinvent a new activity. I can look at the things that we already are doing and make sure that, and give those a new meaning, uh, give it a different purpose, watching TV. I may have done that in the past, but right now we're going to find a show that we all can watch together and we keep pausing. We can't get through a 40 minute show because it takes us two hours because we keep pausing to let's talk about what just happened. And we're not doing this in a way that it's a class and scripted. It's just organic conversation. Um, we are, because, uh, yeah, so we stop and, and talk about what we're experiencing so that we, again, this is where you pass on, you share family values, because then you can think about how, do, what does this mean for us? What are we observing? And is how, how, what does that mean for us as a family? Uh, how would we understand this? So um, I don't have brilliant ideas, but I do want to say, speak about this with your family. Go back to what you already do and look at how you can repurpose those activities and give them new meaning so that you're using them to enhance a sense of family, a sense of togetherness. Um, so I'll leave it at that. 
I think I could keep talking. Thank you, Dr. Muthoni. We also have one question on that is, uh, I'll say geared more to Dr. Waigua. It's talking about uh, culture. The question is, so this issue of most tribes, specifically Kikuyu is going back to its cultural value. Is it biblical? Dr. Waigua, kindly unmute yourself. I almost forget to do, thank you. Uh, yeah, is it biblical? Uh, when, when, when God saves you, he does not uh, displant you from your culture. He, he, he redeems you from your sin. Um, we all are human beings and human beings exist in cultures. The gospel, the Bible is for human beings and human beings exist in culture, whether it is Jewish culture, which we tend to think that is biblical, which is very wrong. Uh, uh, Jewish culture is one culture. And when the, we, we see the gospel going to, to uh, the countries of Europe among the Greeks, and uh, uh, the apostles say, hey, we do not need to force these people to become Jews in Acts chapter 15. They can still be Greeks and they can still do what they're supposed to do. Unfortunately, when the gospel came to uh, our, our, our continent, the Europeans did not do what the Jews did to them in the first century. The Jews said, we are not going to force these people to become Jews. We are going to just ask them to accept Jesus and be good Euro Europeans who do not kill people, who do not hate people, who do not fight just good people. And they became that. But when they, in turn, brought the gospel to us, they wanted to remove our Africanness and pump into us not Christianity, not biblicalism, but Westernism. And so we have wisened up now. And we realize that Jesus has no issue with my being Tikuyu or being Luo or being Tulkana, I can still come with my Tulkana and still access divine grace. And that's what we are talking about here. So uh, my, my politeness as a Murikuyu, my, my uh, uh, just, just speaking my language, particularly for me, it's just speaking my language and being able to, for instance, it's very interesting, my, 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 my son, my son married a white girl. Do you know we had to take dowry there? Because I asked my son, are you Kikuyu or are you European? He said, I am Kikuyu of the Kikuyus. Then if you do not Russia, you will never Russia. If you do not give dowry, you should never ask for dowry. He said, we have to find a way of taking dowry to Florida and so we did. And so the girl married into a Koyo family using Koyo cultural values where, and what we did was because the, 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 the husband was, uh, the, 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 the father was like, oh, you're, you're, you're buying my girl. And we said, far from it. The two families have to exchange gifts. That's how we, we presented it to them. It was such a beautiful thing over there in Florida when we did that. So what I'm saying is we can still be true to our values of respecting elders, of, uh, of being kind to one another, of, of being mindful of. And that is the kind of community I'm trying to engender here in America. Uh, I remember just uh, uh, last Friday, I had some men come help me make a, a, a large chicken coop that I'm making about 100 feet by 60. And we were fencing it and the men came and they said, hey, this is our culture. So yeah, it's biblical for you to be Luo. It's biblical for you to be Lukana or, or whatever you are. You don't have to change that. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Aigua. We are now going to move to the open session where anybody can uh, ask questions or comments. And we are going to start with Arinola, who has a Arinola, please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, 
glad well you are doing a great job for felicitating this evening uh thank you to all our speakers uh, uh dr solomon i have a question for you uh yes, what would you say to parents who have done all the right things and they have not really or are not seeing the same success that you've had raising your children um, I know a few and who are, they go to church, they speak the language, but they are dealing with rebellious and stuff teenagers, um, adults who have drug issues and all those things. And it's not because they are bad parents. It's just what life throws at them. And I know we may not have any on this forum, but we probably know people who are struggling in that area. So as helpers, what would you say to such people? Or what should we take from here to share with them? Uh, I, That's my first question. Second question to all the speakers, is there such thing as over-parenting? So over to you, sir. <laughs> Thank well, you. Let, let, okay. Uh, I think we, we can all chip in here. But I, but I want to say this. Uh, I think uh, some of the problems I have encountered with those parents who say, say they have tried everything is is that uh, uh, they, they they begin to notice these problems when these kids have have, have gone? You know, we work too much here in America, and I'm guilty as charged. But what we have to do, and this is why I talk about shared values and uh, 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 conversations. I I think uh, 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 is is Dr. Mudoni that was very big on on interactions within the family. You see, when, when you are able to engender a community, when you are able to bring the community together, I'm in my daughter's home right now, house right now, and she, I, I like the cooking, I can smell it. But it started when she was two years old, you know, and, and feeling that she's a part of this, this family. Bringing people together, I think that is lacking when we come here to America because we work too much. But, but if we can uh, maximize the little time that we have so that every child knows that they are important. And what I would say to uh, such a child, and I have spoken to uh, some kids like that, uh, and, uh, and I, I have become a father to many of them, is by asking them what are their values. And they begin to see that they are they, they, they are uh, expanding themselves into uh, things that do not affirm their life, okay? These are things that do not affirm your life. So what you need to do, you, you need to change. And uh, uh, so when you look at it, you find that somebody dropped the ball somewhere. Why should children feel alienated? I like what Modoni said, uh, that the children should not be made to feel like they are alien in their own home, okay? They, they need to feel they are a part of this. And uh, I dealt with, uh, for instance, what, what Mudoni was talking about, you know, cheer reading. Can you imagine a Mokorino girl, uh, a second grade, wanting to cheer read, and, and a Mokorino father trying to tell her why that might not work for, it might work for another Kikuyu girl, but for you, because of the values, you have this value, which is going to uh, conflict with, with this value here that you're trying to reach at. So you need to kind of look at them and decide where you are at. And she was able, at that age, she was able to say, you know what? I think I'm going to find something else and not cheerleading because I am a Mokorino and proud wrestle, and I may not be able to do that. That kid said that. Said that. So when you affirm these kids, then they must start when they are one, when they are two, when they are three, when they are four, okay? Having meetings with them. I will skip everything else but have those dates with my girls. They are grown, but I will still do that to this day. And because they, they, feel, they feel connected. And that is what is lacking. Because we come and we are, we are too bossy. We are too preachy. <laughs> That's, what, that's how we come out. We're too preachy, especially those of us that, that are pastors. We grab the Bible and we tell them, hey, the Bible says. Now, in my family, there's another value called the table. 
The table is where when we are praying, we have done dinner, then we ask you, what's going on in your life? This is where we talk about the boys. This is where we talk about cheerleading. This is where we talk about scouting. This is where we talk about those things that are happening. We call it the table. My daughter, who is my associate pastor now, uh, Dr. Chico, she said to me, you know that I have realized those who say they have done everything, if they were to go back when those, that kid was one, was two, was three, they are going to find that they dropped the ball somewhere. And I did too. But what I have to do is to keep affirming and affirming. I was talking with my daughter uh, a few moments ago. I, I was driving. She was, we were on the phone. And uh, I said how I have to keep pledging lo loyalty to my wife, although there is no other. She's the only one. So, so what I'm saying here is we have to do the same with our children over and over again when they are one, two, three, four, and even now that they are 30, we're still doing the same. Uh, and, 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 you, and I'll tell you this, when you do that, parenting will be easy and you will love it when they introduce their spouse to you and that spouse becomes one of our children. I have a white daughter now and I talk with her in my church office for about 40 minutes and we're talking about nothing but salads. And uh, I just cooked Sukuma Daddy, you know, and, and she, this is a white woman. But what I'm saying here, the beauty of belonging starts when they are one, two, three, four, five. And do not forget the dinner table is not just a place where we gob food. It's a place where after we have eaten, even before we pray, we ask ourselves, we go around the table, just sharing our views and pouring our emotions and where we are angry and what's hurting us. And we talk like a family. Thank you, Dr. Waigwa. Um, Dr. Matonya, Dr. Mudoni, um, how about you address the second question? Is there any, is there such a thing as overparenting? I think in my view, that's, uh, that's a difficult concept. Um, I think we can ask, is over, can we overparent? Can we underparent? Um, and in my view, probably overparenting might be a case where we don't let them lose to make their own decisions. We want to make decisions for them at every stage and everything that they want to do. I've seen in school sometimes there's students who cannot even declare their major, one major or another, yeah. because the parents want them to just do what the parent just, as one of the speakers was saying, is as if they are leading our lives. We are, we are letting them live their life, our lives through, through them. So somebody wants, the parents want them to do engineering. They don't even feel engineering, right? So that idea of not getting them giving them time to make decisions, uh, to face disappointments and to overcome disappointments because we want to be there for them all the time and make every decision for them. Not just the ability to explore, you know, they have to be curious, they go out into the world, face life. And if we allow that, I think um, probably that helps, but if we are there overshadowing him, sometimes they call it helicopter parenting or what it is nowadays is what? Is it, uh, maybe they might have another term for whatever it's happening. I think that that in itself might be, might be problematic. Under parenting, on the other hand, I saw it in some of, in my school, especially my son going to school, there are those parents who are considered cool parents cool parents and the and, and high school they're very big on that oh this is the cool parent your dad is cool your mom is cool they can allow us to get away with anything and everything and that's where most of the students used to congregate for parties because they would do if they go to that party the parents there would not even question if they're doing bad things as as dr Oiwe is saying that even they bring booze and they're underage or even the parents might even go and buy booze for them it happens in some of these neighborhoods. Um, maybe it doesn't happen in our neighborhoods, but I think in other, in other, in other 
cultures. Sometimes it happens. So that, in my view, uh, uh, so that, in my view, I think that's underparenting. You're trying to be a friend. You're trying not to disappoint your child because you said no. If it's everything saying yes, 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 yes to everything, I think that gets us to a situation where at some point it will get out of hand. They'll be demanding some do difficult things. And when you say no, it will be difficult. I, I, I have some students who are shoe students, a student who has never been told no, right? And they're quite difficult to deal with. And I told one no, I think whatever I think they wanted to do, and I said no. And it kind of shocked, they were sure shocked that somebody would dare tell them no, because nobody ever told them no. Everything is, oh, yes, honey, that's nice. Just go ahead, right, 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 right. So, so is it overparenting? I think there is. There could be overparenting. There could also be underparenting. I think the best thing probably would be to strike the middle ground. What that is, I think, is just left to to individual parents and sometimes issues of values, as as we are told about what are my values, what are our values, what do I, do I want this child to be, what do I want to be with this world. Because our role as parents is we are giving this responsibility to look after, to take care of this generation and to pre- prepare it for, for the world. And so we are training them to be what they will be as leaders and as people who will be guiding and also as, as parents. So I think we need to set to be role models and to set a good example. So that in my view, I think would be what I would say. It's, there's overparenting and there's underparenting. Well, but... I'd like to hear what others have to say. Thank you, Dr. Mutonia. Dr. Mutoni? I am um, completely on board. The only thing I, I, I have, I was, uh, had a little bit of reservation about is that, that, that the booze is in our own houses. It's not in other communities. Um, and I think the booze, the weed, these things are in our community. Um, pornography. This is things that our own children are struggling with. Again, that's where I said go back to the drawing board. Know your pair, your kids. Spend time with them, um, and that way you can see you'll be able to pick up on changes in mood, changes in behavior, changes in attitude. You will only know that by really truly investing time uh, and spending time with them, asking questions. Uh, you know, one of the things we talk about often uh, when we think about suicide, for example, uh, in counseling, there's always a fear that if you ask a client if they are suicidal, that then you're giving them the, the idea that you're planting the idea of suicide in their heart, in their heads. But the truth is that you're not. If they were thinking about it, asking about it doesn't make a difference. Uh, asking about it now, you will know. It gives them permission to say yes. I was that. That's something I've considered. If you don't ask about it, or if you ask about it and they were not considering it, they're not going to start thinking about it as an option just because you asked. So, in the same way, having conversations with our kids, don't be afraid to ask things. You think that if you ask about X, Y, Z, that then you're giving them the idea. You're not. It's not something that they have not already considered. So. It's, uh, it's important to have conversations in a way that's open. Um, I think I've talked earlier in a forum here, probably to a lot of the same parents, so if I repeat myself, forgive me. Uh, the, the kinds of parenting that Dr. Mutonia is talking about, where you have sort of like a continuum of parenting styles, you have authoritating, uh, authoritarian parenting, you have lies of fair parenting on the other end, and in the middle you have an authoritative parent. And that's where you want to be. You want to be a parent that has authority as a parent, as a parental figure in your home, uh, but you're responsive to your children's emotional needs, that you're aware of their needs, you're there, but you're not just a friend that's the lies of fair. Lies of fair is where you are just sort of, oh, we just hang out. You're like, buddy, buddy. It's good to be friends with your kid, but you can't just be friend. They need a parent. Um, They need someone to provide guidance and to put boundaries um, and help them um, know what's wrong and what's what's not. And on the other hand, you can't just be preachy and and dictatorial and lecturing all the time uh, because then you you put up a barrier to communication. So finding that middle ground where you have 
honest conversations where we, we can challenge them when you need to challenge them, where you can let it down and just have fun with them. It's important to be able to do that. So you can over parent and you can under parent um, and you want to parent, not over or under. Thank you, Dr. Mutani. I, I am just going to add on to that from now a kid's perspective. I, I believe I'm the youngest, or maybe not the youngest in this group, but um, uh, I'll say the kid who's living with, an adult kid living with their parents, and uh, there's a role in my house. As much as I am 35, my mom always says, she is a parent, then a friend. And even though I'm 35, I am not allowed to do certain things. And those are rules that have been set. Those are rules that we follow, including my siblings who are older than me. I think parenting is a continuous uh, process that goes on. And uh, for parents who would think that maybe they have failed, I, I don't think there's any specific way of parenting and that you can feel that you have failed or you have not failed. Everyone is working towards the best of their kids and you always have to remember that. And even if they're not coming in the direction that you would like them to be, just know that you're doing your best. You just have to keep on doing it. As kids, we try to rebel, we try to build the roads, but stand your grounds, people, stand your grounds. All right, anybody else has a question? Anybody question? All right, before we I think, end. I, I think, I think uh, uh, am I out of order? I'm sorry. No, no, sure. Yeah. Go I, ahead. I, I, was, I was going to say it's good for, for, for our audience to capture, uh, especially those closing, uh, those, those remarks made by uh, our two panelists there. And, and, and the operative word uh, as, uh, Dr. Modani finished with was was finding the middle ground. For me, that has been the golden rule. Uh, in, I, I teach philosophy. That's how I make my bread and butter uh, and religion. And, and, and uh, so th that's a, a great word, the golden mean uh, in philosophy. And balance is very important. Here's how I like to, to, to think of it very quickly. Parenting, the successful parenting has to do with finding that balance between authority and just being friends and, and, and letting people have their freedom. Uh, I like to compare it to driving at five speed. I don't know, I, I don't, most of you don't know how to drive, you know where you shift the gears? Now, if you have to be successful in doing that, there's something called a crash. And you have to learn how to balance it. In Kenya, they will take you to a steep hill and the cop would ask you to, to stop the car and then go out, put a pen behind the wheel and ask you to start to move. And if you, if you crash the pen, you are done. So you have to use the crutch. The crutch is, this is where you balance between authority, you know, because essential and, hey, you can do it. So especially with teenagers, teenagers, you have to balance, you have to use your authority wisely, but you cannot be going with it the whole time. You don't press on gas, 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 gas. Sometimes you let off and you, you balance it with a crutch and that family will be very, very good. Amen. Thank you. I see we are almost getting to eight o'clock. So we are going to have the last question. Uh, we have a question from a parent who is asking, how should we compensate our religion education where our kids are missing a CRE that, that is taught in Kenya? Any of the panelists? I'll go with that very quickly. I think that the problem is where the parents have left everything to the class teacher. There is no religious instruction or very minimal religious instruction in the family. And religious instruction does not have to be preaching or, 
or teaching the Bible. It's actually doing it, uh, living the Christian life. Just as simple as we need to go to church, as simple as we can talk like that. You need to repent. What is repent? You need to say sorry. Living, the, practicing the Christian life. And, and I think uh, uh, when fathers quit being pastors because there is a pastor, and mothers stop being pastors because they have a church pastor, and you're not pastoring your own home, this is where we are going wrong. You are the pastor. You are in church. Get the Bible read in your house. All right? You don't have to be to have gone to, to theological school to do that. Just read it and close it and pray. If you do that, it will be, it will enthuse a, a, an environment that will begin to work things out in a very good way. So I want to say, I think the problem there is uh, it's not religious instruction in the schools. I think we need to inculcate that in the, at the dinner table. Thank you. Thank you. As we come to the end of the program, I'm going to ask Jeffrey to uh, share a video. Of, it's a very short video on how you can connect with Bitendo on the topics that have been addressed today. We have different uh, programs in Bitendo that can help support parents in all the areas that, has, uh, that have been discussed today. Uh, Jeffrey, can we go ahead? I would like to give a great testimony to Bitendo for Africa and all the great work that they've been doing. So personally, I think Mr. Jeffrey and the board of director are doing such an amazing job. First, they've been very intentional about the events that they put up in St. Louis. And also, they've been proactive in equipping the African youth so that when they get older in the future, they have the skill set that they need to prosper. I'm involved in this organization because it brings so much life to myself and others through promotion of culture, support, mentorship, movement, education, and overall a genuine sense of community. I came to this country in the year 2010. Initially, it was a struggle at school because the approach to education in this country is different from Kenya. But I found good mentors at Washington University. The professors and the students mentored me until I successfully finished graduate school. I decided that I would want to give the same help to my community. I joined Vitado for Africa and became a mentor. I have three high school students who work under me and the students are doing very well. Their high school grades have improved and their outlook in life has also improved. Vitendo for Africa has been more than a community for me. Um, it has really helped me grow into the person that I am and how I view my community. I have had the resources such as the ACT prep class and I have been connected with a mentor who has been helping me all through high school. It has also been amazing having friends who have the same drive to help other people and to be a part of a community that uplift other people. I benefited from them last year when I had a procedure done after a mammogram and I had just lost my insurance so having my bills paid for and supported was really great. I know people personally who have benefited from them so uh, try the programs you will love them especially for the children and also I would encourage you to support them because it's a community-based organization. I arrived from Kenya in December 2016 and in January 2017 I visited Vitendo for Africa. One of the functions of Vitendo of Africa is to do a mentor-mentee program where we have the mentors introduce you to different resources. I knew it is an opportunity for me to pursue my dream career in computer science and therefore Geoffrey introduced me to Claim Academy where I 
did Java for three months. I started the course in March of 2017. Uh, in the same month of June, I was able to land my first job of a software engineer. I've been a mentor with Videnta for Africa Mentorship Program for the last three years now. I have to say it's been one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. I've had the privilege of working with uh, some really brilliant young people who are uplifting the name of the community in so many ways. As I always say, I would not be where I am today without um, the support and guidance of mentors throughout my life and so I'm happy to give back in this small manner. As an immigrant myself, I know firsthand how easy it is to get lost in this country so I truly feel that uh, this uh, mentorship program is uh, important for our young people. Nintendo for Africa has helped me build my network get connected to my community, and also attain long-lasting friendships that I will forever be grateful for. Thank you so much for Tender for Africa. And I honestly think this is what every city and every state in, in America should be doing if truly the future of Africa is the youth. What are we doing right now to ensure that we equipping the youths, we empowering them so that when they get older, they have the skill set, they have the confidence, they have the knowledge that they need to do to carry on the great work. The great work that their forefathers has been doing. And it's all about a matter of execution. And Vitendo, uh, Vitendo for Africa is doing such that. My name is Nicholas Ngigi. My name is Sebastian. I am Padavi. I'm Grace Maringanga. I'm Ruth. I am Stevenson. Jane Magadi. Samuel Kadewa. Christina Vivid. Safi Uzeye. Jaja Uzeye. Agatha Kinethia. Faiza. Dr. John Mwangi. My name is DeAndre Weeks, and I am with Vitendo for Africa. I am with Vitendo for Africa. And I am with Vitendo for Africa. And I am with Vitendo for Africa. I am with. I am with. I am with. I am. I am. I am. I am. I am. I am with Nintendo for Africa.